All right, you guys, this is going to be my third episode of Inner Demons. Before I get into this, I want to start this out like I did yesterday by extending my gratitude and my appreciation to each and every one of you that sent in a positive comment. Again, this stuff is generating a lot of positive dialogue. Um, last night I did a live and conversations came up. People were opening up. That's what it's all about. That's why I do these videos. So I'm accomplishing what, I'm, what, I'm, what I've been set out to do. Um, if this is helping people tap back into their, their, their childhood, um, their upbringing, some issues that they went through as a kid, and people are talking about it that's it's therapeutical so it's helping people and again it might be it might be a small measure of uh of help but it's something so um i just want to appreciate those of you that had acknowledged um all the things that you guys talked about so anyway yesterday i think i left off where i i had just barely found out that my mother and stepfather were both using heroin I looked through their window and that's the first time I seen them tied off. Um, you know, I, I think I might've seen something on TV where people were shooting shooting dope intravenously. I think I might've uh, seen sitcoms and shit like that. I had never been around nobody that had ever used dope like that. Um, seeing it, it, it blew my mind. And for it to be my parents, um, it, it, it stirred up a lot of, uh, of feelings within within me at that time as a kid um, I couldn't believe it man you know anyway I didn't say nothing that night nothing happened we carried on with the rest of the day like it was a normal day you know I was obviously I was tripping on it but I didn't say nothing so what happened was the next morning my stepfather he booked I don't know where he went he went out somewhere um, he used to go somewhere in the morning sometimes before him and my mom would end up disappearing later on in the day but so that particular morning my mom was in a room um she was still she was kicking back it was still it was early in the morning so i knocked on her door um when i walked into her room i was like uh i was like you know at one point we, we started talking and i said hey um so i know what you're doing and she, my mom was like, "What are you? What are you talking about?" And I was like, "I know what you're doing. I seen what I seen what you and pops been doing." And she was like, "What the fuck are you talking about, man? Sp you know, quit speaking in riddles. What? What?" So I just got up and I walked over to her dresser and I pushed the dresser aside because that's where they used to keep them behind the dresser and it's like a little rolled up sock with the fucking tie wrapped around it. So. Anyway, I, as soon as I moved the dresser and she seen what I was doing, she was already, what the fuck are you doing in our room? Why are you going through our shit? How did you know that that was there? So anyway, I picked it up and I'm standing there holding it and she's, she's like, you motherfucker, how long you been coming in here going through our shit? How come you know where, that, where that's at? And she, you know, she was mad, she was upset, obviously, that I, I had invaded their privacy. Um, you know, after we got past that, I'm standing there and uh, she was like, give me that shit. The fuck you doing? Give, give it to me. So I gave it to her. I was like, mom, I'm, I want to try it. Let me try it. Can I just try a little bit? And she fucking laid into me again. You stupid motherfucker. I'm not going to give you no fucking heroin. Don't ask. You want to do that shit? Go out in the street and do it. You know, you want to be a stupid ass like your mother, be a dope fiend and ruin your life. You go do it somewhere else. I'm not going to have nothing to do with it. So I was like, all right, that's cool. That's cool. But I still want to try it. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, she didn't just, my mom didn't just cave in and say, okay, here you go. You know, she cussed me out. We went back and forth about it. And eventually she got so frustrated. She was just like, okay, here, here, motherfucker. I mean, she was literally shaking. She was like, you, you want some? You, you, wanna, you wanna be stupid? You wanna be a dolphin like your mom? Here, okay, here. So she fucking opened up the plastic. Um, it was in some cellophane and she broke off a little piece of black tar heroin. And she, she goes, here, here, take it. So she gave it to me and I'm like, okay. So I went, I got my mirror. And like I said, man, I seen shit on TV. Maybe sitcoms, documentaries. I didn't know how to do it. I seen people snort coke. I seen people shooting dope, but 
I didn't know how to fix it up. I didn't know what the process was. I acted like I did. So I went and I got a mirror. And uh, I went and I got a mirror and a razor blade. And I sat, I sat down on the corner of her bed and I started chopping it up. Right? <laughs> and all I'm doing is making a mess, man. The shit's getting stuck to the fucking razor blade. It's getting stuck to the mirror. Anybody who knows anything about black tar heroin, you can't chop it up like that with the razor blade. For one, I mean, most of it's all gumball. Some of it's kind of like glass. It'll just start popping and uh, you'll be losing little chunks here and there. Anyway, so I'm, I'm chopping it up and it's sticking to the to the mirror and it's sticking to the razor blade. And I'm, I look over at my mom and she's just glaring at me. She's like, you're fucking really going to do it, huh? You're really going to fucking try it? She, you're going to be stupid like me? You're going to throw your life away? And she was like, unfucking believable, man. I was like, man, I want to try it. You know what I mean? I'm not going to keep doing it. I just want to try it, man, one time. You know what I mean? And she was like, she, she's like, that's the problem. She was like, it's not going to just be one time. She goes, I'm telling you right now, don't do it. I don't want you to do it. If you're going to do it, you're going to do it. But I'm telling you right now, it's a bad idea. And I was like, man, I just want to try it one time. You know, just once. So... I completely disregarded everything she was talking about, man. I continued to chop it up. And then she, like I said, she finally got to the point where she was like, you know what, give it to me. You fucking ain't even doing it right. If you're going to do it, you might as well just, you might as well do it right. She was like, give it back to me. So I gave it to her. She got a cooker. I'm watching her, man, because I want to know how to do this shit. I mean, I, you know, the shit was, it piqued my interest, man. Um. So I'm watching her. She threw it in the cooker. She got some water, threw it on there, and she heated up. She's she's cooking it up, right? She got a spoon. Um, she cooked it in a spoon. Um, I've seen people cooking in all kind of shit. The bottom of a fucking coke can, uh, the, the top of a fucking bottle. But she had a spoon, regular spoon. Um. So she threw some water on it. She heated it up. She was cooked. She cooked it up. And then she threw a cotton on it, threw a cooler, and then she drew it up. She drew up like 10 cc's, 10 or 20 cc's, whatever it was. It was a little bit. And she was like, here. She was like, I'm going to give you a little bit. She's like, I'm only going to, I'm going to run it. Half, I'm going to run half of it. She goes, tell me how you feel. If you feel like you're going to fucking pass out, she said, she said, tell me. I'll pull it out. She said, I don't want to fucking be the reason. I don't want to be responsible for you ODing. And I was like, man, I'm not going to fucking OD. I was like, you know, I didn't know what the fuck I was talking about, man. I was 12, you know what I mean? I had no no sense of uh, of what that shit was about. Um, I thought I did, but I didn't. So, anyway, I was scared to get poked, man. I was scared that she was going to fucking uh, poke me, hurt me with the needle. I mean, I was 12, man. You know what I mean? That's what 12-year-olds... Uh, <laughs> That's what 12 year olds do. You know, I, I said this last night during my live, but I'm gonna say it again because I imagine some of you probably didn't see the live. Maybe, maybe I know some of you probably did, but anyway, when I think back in retrospect, or when I reflect back on the things that I was doing at the age of 12, it's mind blowing because I have nieces and nephews that are, that are 11, 10, 11, 12, and they're so far removed away from that that element that 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 lifestyle that um they wouldn't know how to exist they wouldn't know how to uh, um coexist or or even survive in that type of environment um they're doing the things that regular 10 11 12 year olds do they're going to school they're out in the neighborhood riding their bike they're doing their homework, they're playing Xbox, PlayStation, whatever. But they're not they're not shooting heroin. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um So it it just blows my mind when I when I see them to think that damn when I was their age, this is what I was doing. I was running around in in the Tenderloin, which is downtown San Francisco. That's probably like the worst spot in the city as far as um like it's just it's like Skid Row, you know. You got the, you got Hunters Point, you got HP, you got Sunnydale, 
you got uh, Fillmore, you got the Mission District, you got different areas, and they're all they all they're all kind of bad areas. But the Tenderloin, downtown San Francisco, on 80th Street, 80 and Turk, all down in there, it's it's probably the worst part of the city. I mean, it's there's people walking around selling pills, selling dope, uh, people shooting dope right right outside, right on the stairs. Uh, people fighting in the middle of the street, people shitting and pissing on the sidewalk, homeless people out there sleeping on the sidewalk. You got prostitutes running up and down. That's their strip. Everything happens right there. So, um, you know, twelve. That that was one of my one of my spots. That was one of my haunts right there. Was the Tenderloin. The other place, like I told you guys yesterday, was sixteenth between sixteenth and twentieth on Mission. That's where. It's another, it's a small little area, small confined between uh, those blocks, but it's, it's, um, it has that same type of activity out there, at least back in those days it did. So anyway, um, it just, it, it blows my mind or it did when I, you know, when I first started looking back and thinking like, damn man, you know, it, it, when I was their age, the things that I was doing, it just, to picture them doing it, it, I can't even see it, man. You know, because they just couldn't survive. They're too innocent. They're too, they're they're too blind and innocent to be um, exposed to that type of of uh, environment, that type of lifestyle. Uh, you know, a lot of the times later on, when I would get in the thick of it and I'd, I'd be down there selling dope and trying to support my habit, I'd be in like some of these some of these hotels. Um, well, guys, three and four, five times my age in their 50s, 60s, dope fiends. Uh, they got holes in them, oozing pus and shit because they got abscesses everywhere. You know, the thing about, the thing that's crazy too, man, is it seemed like all these shooting galleries that I used to go to, they're almost, they were almost all identical. Um, so a shooting gallery is a place where it's basically a room in a hotel where somebody, uh, you know, somebody obviously is renting that room, whether it's by the hour, or by the day, by the month or whatever. It's usually an older person that has a lot of medical issues. And you go in there and there's cookers, hypodermic syringes, um, all kind of paraphernalia everywhere. It's just like it's and the whole purpose of that individual allowing people to come in and shoot your dope, cook your dope, cut it up, bag it, whatever you can, came there to do is you got to leave something for the house. If you're going to come in there and you're going to shoot your dope, you're going to leave 20 cc's, you're going to chip them off a little piece. So that's 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 his little hustle. That's how he, um, the, the but the, but what I'm trying to say is it seemed like all these shooting galleries that I used to go to, whether it was in the Tenderloin or the Mission District, a lot of them were older guys that had a lot of medical issues, old men, like either old black guys or old white guys. But it's a trip how there was a lot of parallels or, diff or uh, similarities between all those little places where I used to go do my thing, man. Um, but anyway, not not to get off not to get off track, man. Um, so my mom. Uh, you know, let me let me just say this too, man. You know, I know everybody's got an opinion, and I know that some people are gonna look at this and be like, "Man, what kind of mother gives their twelve-year-old kid heroin? That alone takes the needle and is actually the one responsible for injecting heroin in in their in their child." Um, I understand that, man. You know what I mean? Trust me, I do. Um, but I'm stuck in the in the in in a tough spot because that's my mom and I, I love my mother and I was extremely close to her. And on, on one hand, I can kind of, I kind of understand people's, uh, their opinions, you know, thinking like that. But at the same time, man, I, I, I still always look at it. I've always looked at it as, you know what, man, my mom was caught in a cycle. She never really grew up either. Her childhood, she was robbed from her childhood. She was forced to grow up and um, she didn't make, she didn't always make the, the best choices, but she was my mom. And, um, uh, I just don't blame her. You know, I take responsibility for all the choices I made, including 
putting that needle in my arm. But anyway, so, you know, uh, uh, she's got the outfit. I think it was like 20 cc's. I put my little arm out. She finds a vein. I had ropes back then when I was a kid, man, so it wasn't hard to find a vein. She hits me, bam. She, she runs like 10 cc's in, and I feel it. Bam, it hit me in the chest, man. It was a warm, euphoric feeling that I can't explain. And that's what that's what people chase. It's that feeling right there. It only lasts for, you'll be lucky if it lasts 10 to 15 seconds. It's, it's quick, you know, as soon as you run it in, you feel it in your chest and that warmth, it just goes throughout your body, um, all the way to your fingertips, to your toes. And you feel a, a warm euphoric feeling that, you know, there's nothing else like it, man. Um, people equate it to, to sex, to having an orgasm, straight up. Um, it's pretty damn close, man. Anyway, uh, so she, she ran the first 10 cc's in me, and I was like, I'm good, you know. She's like, you feel it? And I'm like, hell yeah, I feel it. I'm, I'm good to run the, run the rest. So she hit me with the rest. I'm going to tell you guys like this, man. From that day forward, for the next 30 something years, pretty close to 40 years, that shit destroyed my life in every way imaginable. Um, whether it whether it was me making bad choices, me getting involved in the criminal element, me uh, destroying relationships that I had with family, me being a deadbeat dad to my kids. Um, what there was, there's just, it destroyed my life every step along the way, man. There's nothing, there was nothing good that ever came out of that shit. Um, it kept me prisoner, locked up, literally, so to speak. As long as I was doing it, um, it, it, you know, it kept me prisoner in my own body. I know that. Well, you know, let me give you guys an example. So, like, I know I'm jumping way ahead, but, like, when you become a heroin addict, right, you become dependent on that drug, you can't you can't live a normal lifestyle. You can't just wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to go, we're going to go on vacation today. Let's go to Hawaii or let's go to, I don't know, let's go to, um, to St. Kitts the Bahamas, before you go, you have to call the connection and make sure you got enough dope to last. If I'm going to go six days, you got to have enough dope to last you six days. You're out there and you're enjoying yourself and you're out there for six days and you decide, you know what, you and, maybe you and your wife decide, let's stay a couple more days. You can't. I ain't got enough dope. So I got to go back. You know what I mean? That's what I mean by, by being keeping you hostage. You always had to have enough dope to keep you well. Um, and it just, it literally, it puts a lot of limitations and things like that on, on, on your life, man. Um, so, you know, you, you, stay, you stay a prisoner. That shit keeps you locked up, um, so to speak. You know what I mean? I'll get into more of that later as as I talk more about how it affected my life. Even even years later as a an active, full-fledged NF member, I would still struggle with my addiction. The NF, you know, the NF and the Mexican Mafia, I know this is getting a little off course, but the NF and the Mexican Mafia, there's a lot of there's a lot of parallels and similarities to these two organizations. There's a lot of things that they're almost identical. The only thing that's different is the the two major differences is one is the structure, the leadership structure, and then some of the unwritten rules. Um, one of them being the drug policy. So the Mexican mafia, it doesn't have a traditional a traditional um, leadership where you have a hierarchy and a leader, a leader at the top of the apex, somebody sitting at the top that makes all the decisions, a general, something like that. Um, 
they do things as a collective body, kind of like as a collective. They make they, they, they have a voting process, kind of like a voting process. It's basically, they weigh in. They do things as a collective. That's why a lot, a lot of the times they bump heads so much and they step on each other's toes and two two C's are, are vying for the same county and, and uh, there's a lot of pot. That's how a lot of politicking. Uh, um, it invites a lot of politicking. Anyway, um. So that's that's how the Mexican mafia's leadership set up. Uh, it's set up as as everything's done on a collective. The the playing field is is pretty much leveled out. Nobody's really above anybody. There's some individuals that have a little bit of influence because they're longtime members, they're vets, veterans, veteran members, but they don't have um, the leader leadership powers to be like a, a, you know a, a general or a captain or something like that. So the NF is is structured under a paramilitary structure. Where you have captains, lieutenants, generals, um, regimental commanders. So there's a, there's a pecking order. There's a there's a, a a hierarchy. Everybody everybody has a position, and you you fall in where you, you get in where you fall in, um, or you get in where you're supposed to be. So everybody understands their 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 role like that. It. it helps um to run more smoothly you know what i'm saying um whenever you have order like that uh, and it's it's you're operating under a t type of a, a structured leadership like that it, it eliminates a lot of problems but anyway um now the other difference the other difference between these two organizations um I could go over the parallels all day. The money making, the uh, taking their vision to the streets, the uh, um, how they they politic against each other, how the how how it's all about the money. I can go on and on about those things. But the other the other difference is one of the unwritten rules, and that's the drug policy. So the Mexican mafia they don't have a drug policy. There's no discretion. They can use drugs in custody, and it's almost they almost encourage it, promote it. Um, I've been around them all my life. I know. I've seen it. You know, I've been neighbors. Or I've been on the tier with them. I've been in the blocks with them. So when they get their glove, when they hit, um, they shoot dope openly. You know what I mean? Uh, everybody on the tier knows what they're doing. Uh, they'll pass the ad up and down the tier, the outfit, and that's what they do. They get loaded. Crystal. Uh, heroin, whatever they they they're allowed. They drink. There's no discretion when it comes to uh, hardcore drugs, alcohol, or anything like that. Whereas the NF, they actually have a policy that forbids any type of habit forming drugs, hardcore drugs. Um, that being heroin, crystal, PCP. Whatever, any any kind of habit, uh, uh, habit forming hardcore drugs, you know. And the purpose, the purpose behind that is, look, man, we're gonna be out there in the field. Uh, we're gonna be out there hitting licks, killing people, um, selling dope, trying to generate money out there. Me myself, as a, and I know it sounds. Hypocritical, man, it's, it's, it's hypocrisy in the rawest form, you know. Whether I'm doing dope or not, I don't want somebody else riding shotgun um, with me. I don't want them out there with me in the streets if they're all fucking loaded on dope. They're all gowed out on either heroin, cocaine, uh, rocks, uh, crystal, whatever. I don't want somebody that's out there all, all fucked up on dope because you know we're, we're we're taking penitentiary chances out there a lot of us are, are sitting on two strikes and and we're putting each other's freedom in each other's hands we're putting each other's lives in each other's hands so the nf takes it takes it a little bit more serious you know would you want somebody that's that's running at about eh, 70 percent you know they're not really seeing the things that they would normally see had they not been high because their their awareness is affected 
it um it impairs um your awareness you know if you're you're loaded and you're knotted out and you're supposed to be keeping point or something like that you might not be seeing shit that you would normally see if you were alert and you weren't using drugs so that's one of the main reasons why um and plus you know you, you bring that whole that mentality with you that dopey mentality you can't be trusted you know, you're always trying to get over. You're always trying to uh, fidango, finesse uh, something. You start stealing money, start bilking. Um, so that's the reason why the NF forbids any type of habit forming drugs. Is for that reason alone. But later on, years later, I would um, become a, a, a leader. Excuse me. And I would still be struggling with my addiction. There's a lot of C's that don't use. But there's a lot of C's that do. Um, I refer, I call them closet junkies. They were just like me when I was out there. Getting loaded in the privacy of your own home where nobody, where you think nobody knows about it. Sometimes, you know, I was pretty good at, at, at keeping my, uh, my secret, um, or should I say my skeleton in, this, in the closet. You know, uh, I, I was always fitted up. I always wore, you know, brand new clothes out there. I always had a pocket full of money. I always was driving nice cars, trucks, whatever. Um, you couldn't tell looking at me outwardly that I was using dope. You couldn't tell. I wasn't running around with fucking a t-shirt that had blood stains all over it and just dirty and nasty and grimy. I wasn't like that, man. I hit it very well. Um, was I gonna say so? Uh, there, there's a lot of NF members that, that do use dope. Um, you know, unfortunately, that's a reality. That's that's the truth. So, um, anyway, back to back to uh, you know, the first time that I had used this shit when I was with my mom. So, you know, when I'm I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there on on her bed, you know, feeling this shit. And when the sickness, when the the euphoric feeling goes away, then I start to get sick, man. My stomach starts fucking bubbling. I feel uh, I feel nauseous. I end up going, throwing up, and I swore up and down. I'm not fucking with this shit no more. I felt felt like I was gonna die, man. For the rest of the night, I was I was toe up, man. Um, anyway, that probably lasted two or three days, and then I was from that point on, man. Um, you know, I, I was craving it. I, I wanted to feel that euphoric feeling that I had felt. So, you know, when, when, when my stepfather would come home after doing what he was doing out there on the streets, and, you know, it was right before they would ask me to step out, him and my mom. Well, when I would step out, when I was leaving their room, I'd wait till he turned his back or something, and then I'd look at my mom and I'd be like, hey, save me a little bit, right? And she'd be like, get the fuck out of here, man, right? But she, she'd end up doing it. She'd, uh, she'd save a little bit. She put it aside for me. And then later on, that you know, when she had a chance, she'd slide it to me. So I'd wait, and then she'd come in, and she hit me. Bam! And I was, I was, we carried on like that for a while. I was just minding her secret. It probably lasted like a week. You know, every time they got, every time they got ready to, to do it, I started, you know, I was on her. Give me, save me a little bit. You know what I mean? Put a little bit aside for me. So it lasted like a week, man, um, that we were we were doing that. And at, at the end of that week, I woke up one morning and uh, I was sick. I was sick. I, you know, that, that morning I remember I went down and I told my mom, I said, I'm fucking sick, man. I think I got the flu or something. She was like, no, you know, you're fucking strung out. She was like, you've been doing it every day. Sometimes two or three times a day. She was like, you're strung up. She was like, you know what? You're going to have to tell your, your dad because um, I can't support your habit. There's no way. I, You know, I've been giving you um, some of my issue for the last week. She was like, but, you know, I'm not getting enough. I've been sick myself. So you're going to have to talk to him. You're going to have to tell him. You're going to have to do something. So I was like, all right. Uh, uh, I talked to him. So anyway, he comes home later on that that day, and when he comes home, I'm like, "Hey, pops, I need I need to holler at you, man." And he's like, "What's up?" And I'm like, "Hey, man, so 
you know, I've been kicking it with some of my older homies, right? And a couple, a couple that I know, um, you know, their thing is, uh, these guys are into shooting dope, right? And he's like, shooting dope. I'm like, yeah, you know, shooting dope, heroin. And he's like, okay. And I'm like, well, um, I tried it. You know, he's like, what? What the fuck you mean you tried it? I'm like, I tried it, man. But I'm like, man, I, it's even worse than that, man. I'm like, man, Pops, I'm, I'm, I'm strung out, man. He was like, oh, hell no. He's like, you fucking kidding me? I'm like, no, man. I was like, man, I already know what you moms are doing. You know what I mean? I seen you guys, man. I told him how I seen him look through the window. Anyway, he laid into me now. And he was like, well, at the end of the day, this is what he told me. He's like, after he uh, laid into me, he was like, check it out, man. Um, this is this is what, this is is what's happening. You can't stay here no more. Um, you're going to have to leave. He goes, because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You're going to start stealing shit. TV's going to start coming up missing. Radios, shit that, you know, shit that, that we've bought around this house is going to start coming up missing. You're going to start pawning shit. You're going to start selling shit. He's like, man, uh, I'm not going to go through that. Not my house. You know what I mean? I pay the bills, man. He's like, so you got to find yourself another spot. He's like, man, I'm sorry. You know, that's just the way it is. And I'm like, it's all good, man. Fuck it. I'll, I'll find another spot. I'm cool. You know what I mean? I'll be all right. I didn't have nowhere to stay, man. I didn't know what I was going to do. I think I went in my room, started acting like I was packing my shit, like I had an attitude. I think I put my shit in my duffel bag. I didn't even have a, a suitcase, my, my school duffel bag. I start packing my, you know, my clothes, a little bit, a little bit of shit here and there. My mom comes in a couple minutes later and she's like, He's not gonna kick you out. You know, let me talk to him. You know, just um just talk to him. You know, I'm sure he'll probably talk to you. But he's not gonna kick you out. I'm like, I don't care if he does, man. You know what I mean? I'll fucking I I live on the street. <laughs> I was talking big shit, man, bluffing. I was bluffing, man. Anyway, I'm going to say about 30 minutes later, um, I hear him call me. Junior, that's what they used to call me when I was when I was a kid. Junior, uh, um, hey, come here for a minute. So I went I went down the hall, um, opened up their door, walked in. I'm like, what's up? He's like, hey, there's something on the TV for you. So I walk over to the TV and I'm looking, right? I'm, I'm looking on top of the TV. They had a little cable box sitting on top of the TV. And I'm like, the only thing I see is an outfit and a fucking tie. But in my mind, I'm thinking like, that ain't for me. Not with this motherfucker. He's tripping, right? So I'm looking. I'm like, I don't see it, man. He's like, it's sitting right on top of the TV. So I'm like, I grabbed the outfit and the, and the, uh, the tie. And I'm like, you talking about this? And he's like, yeah, I'm talking about that. He's like, that's for you. He's like, look, man. I'll help, I'll help you out for a week. I'll look out for you, man. But you're going to be doing grown-up shit. You're going to be doing that shit. And if you're strung out, you're going to have to support your own habit, man. Um, I feel terrible because I don't know how you're going to continue to go to school or, or, or carry on with the things you got that you need to do. But... I can't support your habit, man. And you're going to have to learn how to support your own. So that's a start for you right there. I'll help you out. I'll give you, uh, like, how much you doing? I'm like, I don't know, look, probably like 10 cc's, uh, maybe two, three times a day, 20 cc's. He was like, I'll help you for like a week or two. But after that, you're going to be on your own. I'll help you. I'll show you how to bag it. I'll show you how to, uh, how to secure it, how to keep it in your mouth for, um, you know, if the cops, the reason why you, we used to keep it in our mouth in balloons is because cops knew you were slinging dope down there on 16th in Mission. What they would do is they just run up and try to, th they try to grab you by the neck and fucking choke you out, make you spit it up. So he's like, you know, I'll teach you how to do all that, but you're going to have to learn how to do it yourself. And another thing, you're going to be doing it. You're going you're gonna to have to hit yourself. Mom, I'm not going to let mom hit you no more. You know, that's how you got to learn how to do all that shit yourself. I'm like, all right, man. So I got the tie that day. 
tied myself off and it wasn't it wasn't hard i basically seen the vein put the thing on top of it pushed it in drew it up and bam that was it um so you know he he, he taught me how to bag it up he taught me how to uh had to basically eyeball 20 20 to 20 dollar pieces of black tar heroin had to put it in plastic then wrap it up in balloons, tie it off in a knot, roll it up to a little ball. And, um, you know, back then they were either selling straight heroin, $20 pieces, or they were selling one and ones like a 10 or $15 um, little bag of, of Coke and like a $15 bag of, of black. So back then everybody was doing Belushi's, man. You had the ether base. The ether base powder, powder cocaine, and everybody, because the ether base, it's not like the cocaine that's out there now. Um, ether base you used to fill it in your chest. It was almost, it gave you, it's almost like you could taste it, a menthol type of feeling. As soon as it hit you, it hit you in the chest. So when you did a Belushi, you get that uptown, and you get that feeling in your chest, and then you get the, it goes straight. You get that downtown the the heroin would kick in um, after that and then you go into a nod right so um everybody was doing belushi's back in those days so that's what i started slinging out there's one and ones so now um now i'm out there on the streets um slinging dope to try to support my habit my mom and stepfather would be on 16th and Mission selling their dope, and I would be on 17th trying to sell my shit. My mom, what she would do is all day, all day long, she would be sitting in this coffee shop that was between 16th and 17th and Mission. She'd sit there, and she'd have all the dope on her, and she'd have all the money, and my stepfather would direct traffic to her. Uh, he'd get a customer, he'd shoot them to her, and then she spit out the bag and booyah, you know, that's how they were doing it. Me, myself, I just had the bags in my mouth. I was just, I was running traffic right there on 17th, just, just like that. Um, they introduced me to a lot of the, the people out there on the streets so that they would become my clientele over time and just being out there on the streets, meeting and seeing people. Um, so, I'm kind of getting confused, man, as far as like around. So I don't know if I if I kind of went over the, um, went over with Sleepy. Like I had met, a, I had met another homie. So I met the Alicons and I met Steve Fernando. Steve was kind of like, uh, Steve kind of introduced me to the, to the Mission District and then the, the, the Alicons, uh, like I said, I was smoking KJ with these dudes and uh, and drinking. That's what I was doing for a while until I started shooting dope. And then you know, whenever I would I would be around these cats, man, uh, they found out I was I was shooting heroin. It, it blew their mind. But then you know I started um, turning these dudes on to it. They come around me and want to come around the pad and get like a little ten dollar hit, or twenty dollar fix man um, it was crazy it was like a little young 12 uh 12 year old dolphin man um, it, uh, it was it was just it was a trip how how everything kind of worked out but anyway so um man there's a lot of shit you know over time i'm gonna have to like probably go back and and go over other shit that happened in, in some of these uh some of these episodes that I missed because there's a lot of shit that I know happened that I'm not I'm not remembering right now. But anyway, uh, obviously I stopped going to school. Um, I, I was I was going to Newman's gym at that time, but the trainer that was training me, he seen a change in me. It. I know, I know. I probably lost a little bit of weight, and I probably just—you could see all the, the, all the signs, man. Because one day he told me he was like, "Hey, man, come here, man." When we were, we were in the ring, and we were uh, 
I was sparring around with him and he was like, look, he was like, look me in my eyes, man. I looked at him and he's like, dude, you're high. Are you fucking using dope? And like, I was like, nah, man. He was like, he grabbed my arm and he looked at my arms and he was like, unfucking believable Unbelievable. He said, you're, you're fucking, are you using dope? And, uh, you know, being right there where, where uh, Newman's gym was, it, it was prevalent. Uh, he probably had seen a lot of people out there in that area you know people shooting dope in that area it was it was very common but i know i was the last person that he would expect that he expected to be using that shit but you know it, it, it basically it discouraged him man he told me uh you know from that day right there he literally dropped the gloves and was like hey man i'm done you know uh, i'm not gonna sit back and watch you destroy yourself he's like you're stupid dude you know you have you have a future in this shit um, but you're, you're throwing it all away, man. You know what I'm saying? He's like, hey, man, if you're ever serious and you get your shit back together, I'm here, man. But I can't be a part of this, man. So, you know, all the, 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 the aspirations I had to become a boxer and all my little Rocky Balboa dreams, they all died right there in the cooker, man. Literally. Um, you know, so... I had alluded to this a few minutes ago. As I'm down there now in the mission, and I'm slinging dope. Now I, I kind of pull back from going to school. I might go to homeroom. Well, by that time in school, I had already pretty much got kicked out because I had started fighting in um, in Burbank, Luther Burbank. I was always getting into fights. After school, I'd be fighting. The principal and the teachers would find out. They'd be out there, and I still we'd be fighting, or I'd fight on school grounds. They end up uh, suspending me, then expelling me. Then they kicked me out of that school and shot me to Visitation Valley. I went to school over there. It's an all-black school. I was like one of the only Mexicans over there. Of course, with that being the case, I always got along with my, Af my African brothers, man. But being we were kids, knuckleheads, um, I stayed fighting over there. Fuck, man. Uh, it's like everybody and their mama tried to... Uh, we, we try to try me over there or wanted to whoop me because I was Mexican or Puerto Rican, whatever. So I got into a lot of fights, man, to the point where at one point they were like, you know what? Uh, they expelled me, suspended me. I went to another school, James Lick. Same thing happened over there. I remember the last fight I got into, I got it. I was a bully, man. I was being a bully. Um, I remember there's this one cat that I walked up to in class and he was taking he was taking uh, uh, attendance and I walked up and I'm like, hey, what's I grabbed his pen or something and he's like, Hey, give me my pen back and I'm like, Man, shut up, man. You know what I mean? Like he's like, Man, can I have my pen so I can finish doing attendance? And I was like, Man, shut the fuck up, man. You know what I mean? Fuck your attendance. And uh, I don't remember exactly what he said, but whatever he said, I just I bombed on him. Two, 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 two. I gave him like a good six piece, and I I hit him in the I hit him in the mouth, and it busts my hand open. And because of that, I ended up I would end up staying in the hospital for about three days because of that too. I had to actually go into surgery because it was like a human bite. Anyway, I hit him in the mouth. Um, they fucking did surgery on my finger. But that incident right there got me kicked out of the whole San Francisco Unified School District. They ended up putting me in continuation. I went to a school called RAP, Real Alternatives Program. It's a it's a continuation school down in the mission. Everybody, anybody and everybody that's from the mission knows about RAP. A lot of a lot of older homies helped um, keep that that um that school together, man. Rap was hella cool, man. They used to have a weight room where a lot of homies used to come work out and go in there anytime and get our money, man. But anyway, um, but even then, once I started, once I got it, really got started sinking deeper and deeper into my addiction. I mean, I started out small and I got that, the kind of personality or the kind of character that I have, man. And I'm not saying this with ego, but I say it with, um, just to help you guys understand whatever I do 
whatever I put my mind to or whatever I apply myself to, I end up, I always end up maximizing it. I always end up becoming the best at it or taking it to an, taking it to its extremes. And my addiction was no different. I shot a lot of dope. Um, and I just, I became really good at everything I was doing, man. Um, years later, I, w I would be shooting so much dope right before I ended up getting indicted. They didn't even believe me how much dope I was using. They were like, that's not even possible. But that's just what kind of, um, what kind of personality I have, what kind of character I have. Whatever I, I apply myself to, I always take it to the extremes, man. Um, anyway, so at some point... I remember we get raided, they kick the door in, the cops kick the door in, they take my mom, she goes back to the joint. She had been a two-time loser, but when I was in foster care, she had been to prison, she had been there twice, she went to CIW, I remember she had been in Chowchilla. When I was locked up doing my first term, she was in CIW. Um, but the, you know, the cops came, they raided us, we lost everything. My stepfather went to prison. My mom went back to prison. I was on the streets on my own at the age of, uh, by then I was like 14, almost 15. Um, then that's all I knew out there on the, is 16th and Mission or 24th, my neighborhood or downtown. So living out there on the streets, I just continued doing what I, what I did, man. Uh, selling dope, supporting my habit. Um, kicking it with dope fiends, older dudes that, that were into that lifestyle, man. You know, I knew everybody down there. They looked at me as like the, the little youngster that uh, everybody loved me, man. Uh, I, I was the little kid that ran around in the hood, just like the little badass kid, man, you know. So I remember, like I said, man, I'm going to have to go back into some of these episodes and sit back and think about things because there's a lot of shit I know I'm missing. I know I'm I'm I'm, uh, I'm blowing through a lot of shit. But let me just say this: I remember my mom at one point she she come out of prison. She came back out, and it didn't take her long for her to become addicted again to heroin. She ended up coming out. She started using again. She started chipping. Before she knew it, she was addicted. So. Now it's me and my mom down there in the in the, the mission district, and I'm I'm trying to I try to step up and take care of both of us. I'm paying the rent, I'm slinging dope, I'm putting you know food on the table, I'm doing everything that I need to do to support me and her. So there's this one day, this one night when we were both sick, both of us were sick, and. Uh, I needed to sell, it was either one or two more bags before I could re-up and then we'd be good, right? So both of us were desperate, man, you know what I mean? But I, I still had a little bit of discretion. My mom, she just wanted to get well, she was sick. So I told her that night, look, go down there on 16th and I'm gonna stay up here like towards, towards 17th. And if anybody comes, I got them up here. If anybody comes from that way, direct them to me down down from that way, right? Down by 16th. So I'm up there like 10, 15 minutes go by after she went down, down the street. And she comes walking up with this cat, Mexican cat. Handlebar mustache, uh, stocky cat, right? And she comes up and she's like, let me get that bag. And I'm like, what? She was like, give me, give me a bag, I need one. I'm like, where do you know this guy from? Because man, I, I, I was running around there in the mission every day for like the last three, four years. I knew everybody out there. I never seen this dude before. So I asked my mom, I said, where do you know this guy from? She was like, he's a friend, I know him, trust me. She's like, give me, give me the dope, right? And I'm like, nah. I look at this dude and I had a funny feeling, man. Something was telling me that dude was bad news, right? So I said, hey, what's up, man? What, what you looking for, man? And he was like, he was like, well, really? I'm looking for some cocaine, man. I'm looking for some coke, some blow. But, you know, she tells me you got some good black and, and there's some decent sized bags, right? So 
I'll buy a bag of, uh, uh, I'll buy some black off you if you got that black. And what I can do is I just, I'll go trade it for some blow and this way I'll get more, right? And I'm like, man, this, so this dude threw a nice little twist. He threw a nice little twist on this shit, right? Made it sound good. Hook, line, and sinker, I bit like a big mouth bass, man. I was like, all right, man, here. I got the $20 bag. As soon as, as soon as we do the exchange, as soon as he hands me the fucking bill, I get blitzed. I get blitzed from like five different directions, all narcs, right? Boom, they rush me. They try to grab me around the neck, uh, pick me up, slam me up against the wall. Uh, and, they're, and they're choking the shit out of me, right? And I'm like, every time they used to try to get me in that position, like, I used to try to turn my neck into the crook uh, of of their arms so they wouldn't be able to choke me out. So that's what I did so I could breathe, right? And I'm like, I ain't got no fucking dope, man. You know what I mean? They're like, spit it out, open your mouth. So I open my mouth. There's, I don't have shit, punk-ass motherfucker. You know what I mean? So they end up... Uh, they end up pulling my pants down. I'm standing there with my boxers. They go through my shit. Like, I know you got some more dope on you. I ain't got nothing else. That was literally, I had like uh, three, four bags left, but I swallowed the other ones. And that's what you used to have to do down there in the mission, man. When you used to sell dope like that, and it was, it was bagged up in those balloons, that was the whole purpose for keeping them in the balloons. Is because the cops, if they knew you were slinging dope down there, they would try to catch you. Um, but they'd have to be quick, man, because everybody knew that if you seen a cop and you had dope, you better start swallowing if it looked like they were coming up, they were coming up on you. That's what I used to always do. And I, I, I was taught that if that happens, you know, after they run your name and if they don't take you in, once they let you go, you go straight to a liquor store and you get a pint of some chocolate milk, shake that shit up, you drink it. And then you wait a couple minutes, and a couple minutes you should be able to get it up. You should be able to regurgitate on everything that you swallow. So um, there's two things that happen, man, uh, around this time. So you know we get we get we end up both going to jail that night. Uh, I was still juvenile, so they let me go. Right, um, couple couple well. Uh, couple days later or something like that they let me go i need somebody to come pick me up so i call on one of my aunts she was always there for me over the years man every time i needed somebody to pick me up my aunt shirley um so she swoops me up and um uh, i don't never see her don't never really kick it and spend time with her out there it's just when i needed help like that is when i turned to her anyway i have her drop me off down on 16th again um, when I got out. So my mom's in jail. I wait till she can get a visit that next weekend. I go up there. I pull her out. And uh, so when I pull her out, you know, we're out there in the visiting room. And, and uh, you know, at some point in the conversation, I tell her, I said, Mom, I'm, I'm taking the case. So don't worry about it. You know what I mean? Um, me telling her that as soon as I told her that, she started bawling. She started crying. And uh, I asked her, why, why are you crying? And she said, I, I, I feel like a terrible mother. She was like, look at what I've done to you. She said, I put, I put a needle in your arm when you were 12. She's like, ever since you've been struggling. And now I catch a case and I'm sending my child, probably sending you to prison for the for the first time, you know, and I told her, man, stop looking at it like that, man. Um, it's not your fault, you know what I mean? Um, you didn't know, and she was like, that's not the point, you know what I mean? You just, you don't get it. She was like, I feel like shit. She was like, I'm, I'm the worst mother in the world. And, you know, I wasn't trying to hear all that, man. Um, but she told me, you know, after she stopped crying, she was like, you know what, baby? She was like, I didn't want to say it, and I would never ask you to ever do something like that. She was like, but if you didn't, she was like, they were going to strike me out. Uh, 
they're probably going to put me in prison for a long ass time. So you're doing the right thing. She was like, but I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm helping to send my child to prison. And she was like, just what a fucking mother, right? Anyway, um, that was like the first case that I caught. The first case. Um, one of the first cases as an adult I caught. Now, I'm going to back up in a minute because I know some more shit. It happened. I started gang banging and all that before I turned 18. But when I turned 18, these cops, man, uh, were always trying to get me when I was out there slinging dope. I always kept a mouthful of fucking balloons out there and I was always slinging, but I was quick and I'd be watching. They'd never be able to get the drop on me. I'd always have my back to the wall. So there's only three ways they could come. I'd never let them corner me like that. If I seen them coming, I start swallowing. You know what I mean? Um, so this one day, man, uh, I had a warrant. I think, I think, matter of fact, I think it was for the case that I had, uh, no, it wasn't because I caught that case when I was a juvenile still. It was a warrant for some shit, man. Something that that uh, I was running. I didn't go to court or something like that. But this was when my, my mom and stepfather were both back in prison right after we got raided. So these cops had never been able to put a case on me because I was just too good at, at slipping, man. Um, slipping these cats. But I remember this one night... I went to this this cat's uh, hotel room. I had a homie named uh, Dicky, and uh, he's like a Filipino and Mexican dude. And that night I crashed out in his in his hotel room. Uh, it was like me, him. He had like a fucking his old lady. I crashed out. Um, yeah, I was sleeping on the bed. He had, they had there was two beds in there, so there was like a little bed that I was laid out on. So I remember, I remember that night I shot some dope when we were doing speed balls and then I fell out, right? So in the morning, <laughs> in the morning I'm laying there and it, all I feel is somebody slapped the shit out of me, right? I was dead asleep, somebody slapped me, pop! And I look up, and it's fucking SFPD. They're like, get up. You're going to jail. You got a fucking warrant, right? I open up my eyes, and I look at them, and I'm like, oh, shit. I'm like, man, fuck, I'm going to jail, right? I know I'm going to get locked up because I've been running. But uh, so I'm laying there, and I'm thinking, I know I had a fucking like a half ounce, or not a half ounce. I had like a, a, a couple grams of black. But I'm thinking, where is it? Is it in my fucking pocket? Is it in one of my shoes? How do I get it? How do I get it and secure it with these motherfuckers standing right over me, right? So I'm sitting there thinking, like, I don't remember what, what, what I did with it. I passed out that night and just went to sleep. So this is probably another, another good one for the most dumbest criminals, man. So that morning, um... That morning I got up, these cops are literally standing over me, um, and I'm trying to like look around where there's a dope, right? Remember I had it in between my fingers when I went to sleep. So I look, and I'm looking on the bed, and I'm like putting my shoe on, and, and they're letting me get dressed, right? Kind of, kind of looking around, I move like the blanket, the sheet aside, trying to look and see if it's somewhere, and I couldn't find it nowhere, man. Couldn't find that motherfucker nowhere. So I was like, well, it's probably it's probably in the bed somewhere under the blankets, but I can't, there's nothing I can do about it, man. So when I didn't have my shirt on, I went, I, got, I stood up, got ready to put my shirt on. I was putting my shirt on, they go, hold up, man. So I stopped and said, what's up? And they're like, turn around. So I, I turned around and I feel, peel something off my back, man. <laughs> This motherfucking shit was stuck to my back. It, I must have, it must have came loose from my fingers and must have went onto the bed, fell off into the bed, and I must have rolled over on the shit and it stuck to my back. That was the only case that them motherfuckers were ever able to put on me, possession for sales case, because I was just too good at slipping them fools, man. They were never able to get me down there. Anyway, um... 
Okay, I know what I get into. Okay, so, uh, so now I'm, I'm shooting dope. I'm strung out. Uh, I stopped going to school. Uh, I'm running around in the mission more often. If I'm not between 16th and 19th on mission, I'm in the tenderloin. If I'm not in the tenderloin, I I will go up towards 24th and uh, start kicking it with the homies up there that I would end up meeting. You know, I was already strung out when I would go up there and I would run into a lot of the homies. When I was young, when I was real young, I believe this was probably even before I started shooting dope. Uh, that's what I'm saying. The times kind of... Uh, they're coming to me, but a lot of this stuff happened around all the same time, so I'm going to have to go back into this later. But anyway, when I first started kicking it with my neighborhood, uh, I didn't get jumped in. I didn't get jumped in to SFM or, or LTM, Little Time Mission. When I was introduced to that hood, from that point on, I was always there in the neighborhood. I was always posted up on the corner. I was always right there by McDonald's um, on 24th and Mission. Or I was between 24th and Petrero. That was my hood, man. Um, so what, I'm, what I mean by getting jumped in is, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with, the, with getting jumped in. It's basically when four or five guys from a gang um, when they're getting ready to bring in a potential uh, a prospect or a new member, that you go through a beatdown. Um, whether it's for a, 100 seconds, 114 seconds, uh, 30 seconds, whatever it is. It's a, a certain amount of time where these four or five guys, they're going to bomb on you. They're going to bomb on you, kick you, punch you, and you fight back. And the whole concept of it, it's supposed to be so that you show them that you have heart by fighting back. I mean, they beat you down, beat you into the game, but you fight back and you're still on your feet at the end of 114 seconds or however long you go through this um, through this little ritual. Uh, then at the end of that, they embrace you. And, you know, they're like, hey, homie, yeah, you got heart. You got gorra, homie. You know, you're in, bro. You're one of us now. I didn't go through that. A lot of my homies didn't go through that. I didn't need somebody to punch me in my mouth and sock me in my lip to tell me I was from the mission. You know, I was always there. Like I said, I was always posting up. I was always out there. That was my hood. I wrapped it like it was mine. I terrorized it like it was mine. Um, I used to run up and down that street like, like I owned 24th, like as well as did a lot of my homies. You know, a lot of my homies were the same way. So at some point, at some point, I ended up getting introduced to uh, Sleepy, John Romero. This is, the, this is the individual that I refer to in my book as my criminal mentor. Because, like I said, he basically, he laced me up, taught me how to be a criminal. Everything I learned out there came through him. Um, I think I touched on this yesterday, but I'm just going to say it again. You know, we started out small doing car burglaries, and then it escalated to uh, residential burglaries, uh, commercial burglaries, smashing grabs, um, robberies, home invasions, carjackings, whatever. It just continued to escalate. And, um, you know, the, the sleepy thing was smoking KJ. He likes smoking killers, man. So a lot of the times we go in and we, we burglarize these houses and the, the merchandise that we used to get from these houses, we would go sl go sell it to some of these fences down in the mission. A lot of them were... were uh, me and Sleepy are running around. We're running around the mission. We're robbing people. We're, we're, uh, I'm starting to get deeper into uh, in the criminal activity now, man. Uh, and when we're doing this stuff and we start doing robberies, that, that was my thing. That was that became my mo was robberies. Um, I like doing robberies. Once, once I started doing them, I became addicted to them. I couldn't stop. It was, the money was fast, and I didn't mind jumping on somebody, socking them up, taking their shit. Yesterday, I, I might have mentioned this yesterday, and I think I even mentioned this earlier when I I did a live with Josh uh, from the Homie Hangout. Shout out to the Homie Hangout. But uh, 
you know, I mentioned the status mobility system, which cons which is basically um, how you acquire your street cred or your prison cred. And it's 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 like this, man. Uh, you know, the one thing that I learned early on as a youngster as a, or as a young gang member was that the more violent I was, the more blood I spilled, the more people I beat up, stabbed, shot, stomped out, molly whopped, whatever, whatever you want to call it. The more people I hurt, the more people feared me. That's how it works, man. Um, if you got a habit or a history of beating up a lot of people out there on the streets, stabbing people, shooting people, slapping cats around, homeboys, they'll be like, hey, this is a crazy motherfucker. This is my boy right here. You know what I mean? This motherfucker got hands and he's a fool. Started emulating. I seen, you know, a lot of my older homies uh, get that kind of respect. And I wanted it myself. So that's what I started doing. You know, there were times when um, we'd be out committing some type of uh, robbery or a burglary or something. And I would commit some type of sinister act of violence. No matter what, bashing somebody upside the head, stabbing somebody, shooting somebody. For no reason. The, well, the only reason is to show out in front of the homie. There was no real purpose behind it other than to show out in front of the homie to show them that I was capable of hurting somebody. And I became desensitized by that by that violence. I could go out and hurt somebody, and I mean really hurt somebody. And five minutes later, I could go stand in a, in a taqueria and go order a fucking burrito or some nachos. And uh, I wouldn't even think about it. I would suppress those, you know, my conscience. I didn't have a conscience. You know, I got one now, it, it, it came back years later. <laughs> now I'll be the first one, if I see a little spider or a little bug in the house, I'll be the first one to scoop his little ass up and throw him out the back door instead of stepping on him. Um, that's my conscience, man, you know what I'm saying? Straight up. Um, so, you know, eventually, me and Sleepy, I mean, we had a we had a routine, man. We get up at around three o'clock in the morning and we go out in the neighborhood and we we either burglarize cars that had nice stereo systems we take we take the stereo out the the speakers the amplifiers the tweeters sometimes i take the whole fucking dash out i'd be running down the street with the whole fucking dashboard but we take out all the um the audio the stereo equipment and um we go, we go and sell that for so we could buy more, more KJ. Uh, you know, as 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 time, as time went on, um, everything continued to escalate. We can, you know, we got deeper into it, man. Uh, the things we started doing, people started getting hurt. We started doing robberies. We started doing uh, smashing grabs, takedowns. Um, you know, it didn't take me long before I would end up getting caught up and I started going through juvenile. You know, the other thing too, man, is I burglarized all our neighbors. When we were living in Excelsior, I burglar literally both of my neighbors on each side of us, the neighbor behind me, the neighbor across the street, I burglarized or robbed all of them, took all their shit. Some of them found out about it. Some of them knew, but couldn't prove it. But that's how bad I was, man. You know, uh, my mom and uh, stepfather hated that shit. They're like, man, you fucking uh, can't be burglarizing and robbing the neighbor's houses, man. I mean, it's fucked up. But anyway, you know, at some point, I started getting in trouble. I started ending up in juvenile hall. I started getting caught up in that court system. Uh, this, You know, the one thing I'll say about, um, about when I used to get caught up in, in uh, the juvenile But when I started getting caught up as a juvenile, they gave me chance after chance after chance, man. Literally, I had a, a probation officer that took an interest in me. This dude was, he was a good dude, man, Mark Mardo. I still remember his name. Um, but he did everything and anything he could to keep me out of the youth authority, man. He really tried his hardest, but I kept on pushing. It didn't matter what he did, I kept on fucking pushing back and kept fucking up. He must have put me in about 
four or five different drug programs. I went through Delancey Street, Walden House, Our Family, uh, Serenity House. I mean, I went through some intensive um, uh, uh, drug drug treatment programs, some of the synonym based programs. But anyway, um, you know, once I started getting caught caught up in the juvenile justice system, um, eventually I, I, you know, I turned eighteen, and by the time I was eighteen, I was already I already had a case, man. Uh, you know, backing up again, though. You know, when I wasn't down on a, a, a mission in 16th or downtown San Francisco in the Tenderloin. If I wasn't down there, I'd be up on 24th, start gangbanging. Um, you know, back in those days when we were gangbanging, we used to fight against Daly City. We used to fight against Fogtown, Eastside Daly City, Diablo Park, 22nd, uh, 30th Street, Cortland Boys, 22nd. There was a lot of red on red in the city back in those days. It wasn't, there wasn't really any Southsiders out there. There was nobody on 19th. There wasn't no Sureños there yet. That would come years later. But I, we started gangbang. I started uh, gangbang with my homies, man. Uh, some of the homies I remember kicking it with when we were younger. Jaws, Penguin, Poochie, uh, Crime, Playboy, uh, Tigre. Um, there's a bunch of others, man. Uh, uh, Smiley. Uh, Paulito, um, Ears. There was a bunch of us. Um, if we weren't gangbanging with other gangs like Daly City or Excelsior or Southeast, if we weren't getting off with other gangs. Man, you know, when some when a gun would, would, would somebody would pull a gun out, like I said, I wanted to be the first one to grab the gun and shoot somebody or be the first one to stab somebody, be the first one to, to throw the first punch. I was a bad youngster, man. I, I used to do some stupid shit for no reason. Um, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna go back into all the gang banging shit later in a separate episode. Like go into the the separate incidents that I remember. Like there's a lot of them, man. Um, I could literally sit here and go over uh, just numerous. Uh, Incidents that I had, man. These, 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 these individuals. Or years later, when I started gangbanging with the Southsiders, when they did um, begin to have a presence out there in San Francisco, they knew me by my fucking name. That's how much I used to. Um, that's how how much I used to go down there and uh, try to terrorize their neighborhood. They they knew me by my name. They see me and. Uh, you know, there's that fucking dude boxer right there, man. Um, yeah, it's a trip. I think I'm going to go ahead and conclude with that right there. Um, this is a good place to break before I go into episode four. Um, so, yeah, man, I'm, I'm down there in the mission now or in the, the tenderloin. I'm slinging dope. I, I already caught a couple cases. You know, I'm getting pretty close to turning 18 now. Um but I'm starting to get into more trouble um, as far as the juvenile justice system and um, all that stuff's about to, more stuff's about to start happening as I get older. But again, I think I'm gonna go back later on and start going into all the gang banging stuff because there's a lot of a lot of specific incidents. And I mean, I don't, I kind of want to go run through this, but I don't want to stop and then just start telling all these different more stories. So I'm gonna do it like that. Later on, I'm going to come back with an episode and kind of go through uh, or different episodes and go through incident by incident by incident. Anyway, with that being said, man, I want to thank you guys for uh, for supporting this, what I'm doing. Um, I want to, again, extend my appreciation and gratitude for all you guys that are opening up. And I encourage you guys to, um, you know, you can those of you that would like to come on the channel, want to get on with Sandman and, and uh, either on the panel or come on and talk about your issues, you guys are welcome. We're going to try to do a, we're going to try to put together a clubhouse so that we can start taking calls and interacting a lot more with you guys. I have a lot of ideas, man. Um, until that happens, though, uh, 
uh, we're just going to continue pushing like we've been doing. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and uh, cut this one short for now. But again, I appreciate you guys. And that concludes episode three.